I'm Steve May. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Pixar. I've been at Pixar for 24 years, half my time as a CTO and half my time working on the films as one of the supervisors. One of the really cool things about um, I'm working at Pixar now and is is we we get to um, interact with the other studios that are part of Disney. So ILM and Disney Animation, um, Marvel and, and other entities. And, and the other one is Disney Research uh, Studios, which has a great, a great research team. Um, between them and Disney Animation and us, we've been working on the denoising problem for for many years. We had an earlier denoiser that actually had kind of originated at, at Disney Animation. And then Disney Research created this new machine learning based denoiser that kind of took it to the next level for us. We used it for the first time on Toy Story 4 internally. So the way that it works with these, diff these different groups is we are all independently kind of developing new technologies and trying to innovate in interesting, interesting places, but then we share technology. So if we develop something at Pixar, we freely share it with the other studios. We share it with Disney Research. We also do joint efforts with Disney Research. In this case, Disney Research led the core, the core technology for this new denoiser. But then we worked really closely with them to train, to provide the training data and to refine the denoiser to get it from kind of research grade <laughs> to production grade and we can use it in films. And that actually takes can take quite a bit of time. First started using it on Toy Story 4 and it cut the compute time of our frames down by 75%, a huge amount. So we spent one fourth the rendering time. So we've been using it for, for a number of years, refining it and improving it. And the nice thing now is we can also now, we can include that now with RenderMan. Now that it's kind of mature and we feel good about it, we can include it in, in RenderMan so that anyone who uses RenderMan will have access to it. It's kind of mind blowing how refined of an image it can produce with such a small number of render samples. We push the knob really far just to see how good it can be. And sometimes you can't even tell what's in the image. It just looks like almost sometimes just random pixels. And then we put it through the denoiser and you actually get something that looks like a final rendered image out of it. We discuss inter internally with the, our partners, like Disney Research and, and the other studios, like what things we want to share externally, whether it's open source or it's commercial RenderMan. But that was a fairly straightforward conversation. Everyone felt like, yes, there's an obvious benefit to RenderMan's users to have this feature and we should do it. So then it's mainly just some work on the <clears throat> on the RenderMan side to really productize it. So that is, you know, when we when we transfer it to production, it's still got lots of kind of Pixar specific things in it. And so it's really just a matter of making it more, more generalized and uh, cleaning up the front end as far as the user goes, and then packaging up that so it can be sold as a, a software product with RenderMan. Our full focus on that team is to replace RAS with the new XPU renderer, um, but getting it to the point where it's fairly easy to make a toy version of a renderer that runs really, really fast and uses the GPU and uses path tracing. You can make example renderers or even fairly sophisticated renderers fairly easily. Making a renderer that you can use for real production and to render like movies like Lightyear and Turning Red or Star Wars films, films like The Lion King, like there's a lot of, of nuts and bolts you have to do. And that's just, it just takes time. It's fairly complex to develop a renderer for the GPU first and CPU versus just the CPU. So I, I think we're getting we're getting in reach. It's close. It's coming up soon, but we don't have a specific time frame to, to talk about right now. Hopefully soon. We 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 wanted to fix our just as bad as everyone else wants it wants it wants it outside. And also we're starting to you know one of the things we like to do is and the great thing about RenderMan is that people who use RenderMan know that Pixar is using it internally and testing it and we've and, it, and it's going to be robust and it's going to be fast. And so we are starting to use XP more and more internally. And so that's part of the process too. So we just want to make sure that it is it is really good before we, we put it out there in full in full flesh mode. USD is is based on a lot of R and D, so like decades of work at Pixar. So in some ways it's mature. In other ways, <clears throat> it's still kind of new. Our intent is not necessarily to solve the the metaverse problem. You know, our our, our intent is really to solve the hard problems that we need to do to to make make movies and make streaming content. But it's the adoption and the traction that it has gotten beyond beyond the film industry has been super exciting. And I do think it's kind of clearly the best 
thing out there for describing really complex 3D scenes. And if you think about what is the metaverse is always like the first question, you know, when people people talk about that. But if you imagine like having like very rich, like 3D worlds or environments, right? Made of 3D assets, characters, sets, and props and, and lighting, et cetera, all those things. And you imagine a lot of people interacting with that world simultaneously. USD is really well suited for that because those are the same problems we were trying to solve for Pixar <laughs> when we made USD. For us, it was like, how do we make really, really complex, rich 3D worlds and characters for our movies? We don't have thousands or millions of artists working on one of our movies at once, but we have many, many hundreds. <laughs> so we had to solve this problem of like, hey, we're working on a shot in the film and there are, there are multiple animators working on the shot, there's lighters working on the shot, there's set dressers and other artists that are all working on the shot simultaneously. So. USD can handle that. USD can handle multiple people interacting with this with this scene. Now, one of the coolest things is that it has this concept of layering, so that if you had a if you had a model of a city, but all you want to do is move one sign, you know, you can just make one layer that's a very very small thin layer that just says, "Hey, that sign over over there down the street, just scooch that over a little bit," and that's all that has to be in that layer. You don't have to go back and edit. The, the, the block or the building where that sign is located. You can just directly manipulate the, the sign in, in a very lightweight, fast kind of way. And so I think those, those properties of USD do apply themselves very well to like this idea of having, having virtual worlds that are really, really complex and you have a lot of users in them. So it is the best thing that exists currently. And I think it'd be very hard to build something better right now. And so, yeah, I do think it's be an awesome kind of foundational piece. And internally, we do things that are not included in USD currently, just because we haven't figured out the right way to include them with USD. Things like animation curves. So a time varying variable that you can use to animate something over time is not part of, part of USD. There is not support for building character rigs beyond kind of some fairly fairly basic things that we we provide in one of the schemas right now. So, um, you know, that's two. I think uh, materials and surfacing is an area that's, that's developing, but it's still in progress as well. So there are those kind of fundamental pieces that we even do at Pixar. And then when we talk to people in, in gaming or people that do more interactive kinds of experiences, you know, they give us another list of, <laughs> You know, here's other things we'd want to do to support interactivity and real time uh, that we don't uh, have yet in USD uh, as well. Things like level of detail. So there's actually, it's still kind of early days, I think, as far as USD goes, as far as figuring out everything else that we do need to add to it. There's a lot, actually. We have a couple of different ways that we kind of engage with different people in the community. And sometimes it's it's through the forum. It's through the working group that's part of the Academy Software Foundation. And then we also have direct interactions with with other companies like NVIDIA um, or Apple. We have great uh, kind of working sessions with them where they talk about the problems they're trying to solve. And usually there's a lot of overlap with what the problems that we're trying to solve at Pixar. One of the things we're, we want to do better is support those external contributions. They're starting to come. I think NVIDIA announced a number of things at SIGGRAPH that they are adding adding as far as their contributions back to USD. It's really exciting that all these companies are really invested and, and they, want to, they want to contribute back to the open source uh, project. We want to be able to move even faster because there is so much interest around USD and there's so much activity there. And we also want to allow other people to make contributions and discuss new ideas for, for modifying USD more, more efficiently, more effectively. Um, our engineers are super busy <laughs> trying to respond to community requests and also develop the software themselves and, and evaluate new specifications and new features. So the goal is really kind of beef that team up so that we can do all those things better. And we're probably going to increase it by three to four times its current okay. its current size. Omniverse, we're very appreciative and excited about the fact that NVIDIA has built this platform on top of USD. And it really is a, a, a platform then that you can do so much more on top of it. We are not currently using it at, at, at Pixar because we already have fairly sophisticated ways for us to share our data between our apps and across our users. But what I find really inspiring about it is the way that Omniverse is enabling a lot of other industries to use USD to solve problems. So the expanse of 
of domains that NVIDIA covers with Omniverse is, is huge. I only know like this much, <laughs> but the fact that they're using, they're using it to help optimize the construction of say manufacturing plants, you know, make, by making digital twins, make a digital version of a, of a factory or a manufacturing facility, and then you optimize it virtually. And then once it's optimized, the, you, you've, you've trained the robots, you've optimized the pathways and the different uh, functionality of that facility, then you, then you build the physical one. And the fact that that is leveraging USD is really, uh, you know, again, that's, that's got nothing to do with what we do as far as making content, but super, super fascinating. And just the impact that Omniverse lets USD have on things outside of our industry is really, really pretty awesome. One of the things that I found really interesting, there's a conference called DigiPro. This is the day preceding SIGGRAPH about kind of, uh, you know, production processes um, and, and papers directly related to uh, film and content production. And one of the interesting things I found there was the way that people are using USD is going is in some ways going beyond the way Pixar does, which is pretty exciting. And it was companies, even companies out, again outside of the film industry. So there were presentations by, for example, uh, Netflix and Animal Logic. But there were also uh, a, a presentation by Ubisoft. Large companies and the way that they're using USD to automate their content delivery uh, infrastructure was was super interesting. And I think it's. So this was kind of like pipeline -y kind of stuff, you know, not necessarily like, hey, this is going to be a way to make a new visual that you'll see on the screen, but a way to automate the processes of data and imagery and, and, and uh, video moving through their pipelines, especially companies that have lots of content producers. And I found that to be um, uh, super, super fasc fascinating. I think it's a the fun thing about making a technology like USD that's kind of a, at a foundational level is that then it starts to get used in ways you didn't, you would never have thought of <laughs> or didn't anticipate. And we're starting to, we're starting to see that more and more uh, with USD. So that, that's the first thing that, that kind of uh, uh, came to mind. Most things are not that easy to adopt or just say, hey, we should start using that or we should change the way that we do things, but to be the way they do it. We have a lot of discussions. So we do a number of things with like my team within the studio, we also have open discussions with everyone from Pixar who went to SIGGRAPH. So we do a thing we call the rewind, where after SIGGRAPH, we um, either get together either in person or virtually, and everyone kind of talks about one or two things that they found exciting or interesting. They show visuals, they might show the paper, uh, videos, uh, and we kind of just kind of hash it out. And then I would say over a period of, of time, we kind of continue to evaluate like what things are interesting enough to us that we would actually invest in. We're super busy, <laughs> so it's hard to, it's hard to drop stuff, but it's just, it's always inspiring, you know, to go to, to go to SIGGRAPH and see, and see new things. And so um, it's just kind of, I'd say it's largely organic. Yeah, you know, because there are so many areas and there are so many different places where we touch technology that, you know, the individuals often have a very big role in that. You know, one person can come back and say, I saw this thing <laughs> from Pixar. Um, you know, like I said, the, the best ideas don't usually come from me <laughs> or from <laughs> management. They usually come from an individual, an engineer, an artist who sees something and then they generate the energy around it to try to see if it's something that we can we can deploy. And that's that's the way most things happen for us anyway.